Howdy folks, hope you've all had a great weekend and welcome back to Mingles with Jingles, sponsored again this week by NordPass. I'm sure you all know the drill by now, 50% off a two-year NordPass premium plan with an additional one month for free. As usual, completely risk-free with NordPass's 30-day money-back guarantee. Get over to nordpass.com slash jingles and use code jingles to get this deal and keep those passwords safe and organised. Oh look, we've been joined by Akazuki. Akazuki's going to talk about another cool feature of NordPass. Because it's not just a password manager, it also works as a secure data vault. Where you can store, for example, things like your Wi-Fi, alarm system passwords. <laughs> That's right, yes. And because um, you can sync Nord across all of your devices. So you get yourself a new phone or a new tablet or whatever. And you want to connect it to your home Wi-Fi network, but you can't remember your Wi-Fi password. So you've got to find the password and then input it manually, except with NordPass you don't. Because you can store your Wi-Fi passwords in a secure note shared across all of your devices. So install NordPass on your new device and you can access the Wi-Fi password from it. It's all about convenience as well as security. Isn't it, Akazuki? Akazuki's busy eating my pen. <laughs> <laughs> yep, they did warn me it never worked with children or animals. Anyway, 50% off a two-year NordPass premium plan with an additional month thrown in completely free of charge, all 100% risk-free with NordPass's 30-day money-back guarantee. Head over to nordpass.com slash jingles and use code jingles to claim this deal while it's still available. Since we're here, I thought I'd give you another quick look at Fort Jingles, or what's going to be Fort Jingles once the whole purchase goes through. We're here in the entrance hall. I believe that's the gas heater. Not particularly happy with the bare wires. I'll, obviously with cats I'll have to keep this door shut, but it won't be a problem. It's just a storage closet. I'll pop down again to take another look at all of the power sockets and where any Ethernet lines were, for example because I'm probably going to need more. But yeah, since last we spoke, still no word from the lawyers. Well, that's not strictly true. There had been no further word from the lawyers, because, you know, once the lawyers get involved, everything crawls to a halt. But nearly two weeks ago now, I got a letter from the building societies covering the other 50% of the mortgage. And uh, it was basically them offering the mortgage. There was nothing for me to sign because they'd sent signable copies to my lawyers. Well, a week went by and still nothing from the lawyers, so I sent them an extremely irate email last Monday morning. And wouldn't you know it, within 20 minutes they were on the phone back to me. <laughs> Apologising and explaining why everything had been taken so long. And by the end of the day there was an email uh, with a summary of everything that they'd done thus far. Which wasn't a lot, but hey, if you want to get stuff done, cause a fuss. Gas oven, love that big central ring. Built-in dishwasher, tumble dryer. I've never actually used it. Well, I have had a dishwasher before. Um, the landlord of the place I live in at the moment had one. In fact, still does. But I never use it. I just prefer washing things by hand. There are plenty of power sockets, although I suspect I'm probably going to need more. Uh, particularly in the kitchen. Because of all the cooking gadgets that I have. And also down in what's going to be the man cave. Because no matter how many are there... I'm going to need more. Dining table's going to go there. You can see, I mean, this this room, combination lounge and kitchen, is absolutely huge. Definitely going to need to have something made for the window sills. You can see how thick these walls are. It's an old 1860s army barracks. It's a grade two listed building. Uh, the internal walls are absolutely not as thick as that. This whole thing was just one big, long barracks room and it's been converted to residential. Downstairs is where the three bedrooms and the two bathrooms are. So that is going to be the man cave. Plenty of space, also plenty of power sockets, but like I said, I'm probably going to need more because there are going to be two PCs, at least two monitors, an airbrushing station, going to need the extractor fan for the airbrush and all kinds of stuff. Thanks to getting that tax rebate, which came at the best possible moment. Oh uh, yeah, and I don't like that mirror, that's going to have to move. 
But thanks to that tax rebate, rather than having to rely on IKEA or Amazon to furnish, you know, all the workstations and the desktops and the shelves and so on and so on, I think I can probably now afford to actually get a carpenter to come in and just build it all. Oh, random Eddie there. <laughs> uh, here's the guest bedroom. Oh, it's going to be the guest bedroom, and yet the bed comes with it. It's a very, very good, solid single bed, although the table and chair probably don't come with it. Again, lots of power sockets. And it looks like there's a TV socket in every room as well. And what I at first thought was an Ethernet output, but I think now is actually a phone line. So I'm, again, I'm, this is the reason why I came down to check it all out, to see what I was going to have to get done by an electrician before I move in. So probably more power sockets. And also I want to get wide Ethernet in every room. Because I'm probably going to need it. Probably also get uh, full speed Wi-Fi full speed high speed wi-fi in every room too because uh, again the place where i currently live uh, it's basically the walls are reinforced concrete which have been plastered over which basically means i'm living inside a faraday cage and i can't get the wi-fi to extend from one room to another but that won't be a problem here because these are not structural walls the internal walls in this place it's the odd sweet bathroom hello it's me it's just a shower, a wash basin and a toilet. Heated towel rails. Um, so yeah, I'll have to get an electrician in. Because I want Ethernet in every room. And I still haven't actually figured out where the um, internet connection is in this place. Master bathroom, shower, wash basin, toilet, bath. Bath has a, a shower in it as well more heated tail rails all good stuff so this is it fort jingles hopefully sooner rather than later so as a result of my reconnaissance there are six power sockets in all of the three downstairs bedrooms there are 14 power sockets in the upstairs combination lounge and kitchen there are two in the downstairs hallway and there's two in the upstairs hallway there's also one, what I initially thought was an Ethernet outlet, in every room. But which I'm now pretty sure are actually just phone jacks. So I don't actually know exactly where to connect my internet router. So that's an issue. But I do know that my current internet service provider does also provide internet for this place. I'm just, I just don't know exactly where or how. So yeah, that's something else that I'm going to have to investigate. Once I've got that figured out though, I may be able to get away without having Ethernet in each room because you can adapt. What's the right way to put this? Currently, um, I have an internet connection in two of the rooms that I rent at this place and obviously there's the one that comes through from my ISP via the router um, and then that goes through a power socket you can buy power socket adapters that actually use your house's electrical wiring to propagate your internet signal so i've got a line going from the router into an adapter in the plug socket in the wall where i get the power for the pc and the monitors and blah blah and so on and so on and then in one of the other rooms where i've got the playstation which i'm basically using as a media station to watch videos and stream stuff on the big TV, um, I have another one of these adapters plugged into a power socket that picks up the internet signal over the house's electrical wiring and then feeds it to the PlayStation. And it does work extremely well. I mean, when Rita was staying here, that was the room that she used and she would live stream to Twitch over that connection. So, you know, it's good and it works. And it's certainly going to be a lot cheaper than having an electrician putting wired Ethernet into every room. Um, because I already have the adapters. I just have to buy a few more adapters. It wouldn't be an issue. But since I'm probably going to have to get an electrician in to put in extra power sockets, it doesn't really hurt to get them to put wired Ethernet in at the same time, since you know, you're paying them for their time. We'll just have to see how much money's left over, because this place can very, very easily turn into a money pit. <laughs> and yes, I have seen the Tom Hanks movie. Don't worry, it's not going to be nearly as bad as that. But we'll have to see how the money goes. Obviously, I'd like 
wired Ethernet in every room. I'd like full speed, I keep saying full speed, high speed Wi-Fi throughout the entire property, but we'll see what, what we can actually afford. So, anyway, please tell me you watched yesterday's War Thunder video. I mean, I know 70,000 of you did at the time of recording this. I say yesterday, of course, this is going out on Monday. Please tell me you watched Saturday's War Thunder video. God, you wouldn't believe I do this for a living, would you? <laughs> um, that video was amazing. And I'm, I realise I'm tooting my own horn here. And I really did hype that video up. But I believe the hype was justified. It was the most ridiculous thing I've seen in a, a very, very long time. It was hilarious. I realise YouTube doesn't show dislikes anymore, does it? Because we're all precious little snowflakes now. But that video... I mean, the likes and dislikes, only the likes are available to the public, but on your own videos, you can see the likes and dislikes. So I can tell you that that video, which is currently sitting at 72,776 views, has had 8,080 likes and only 67 dislikes. It's sitting at an approval rating of 99.2%, which is actually very high for a War Thunder video because the diehard World of Tanks fans tend to give those thumbs down. Um, and it's not the most approved video that I uploaded last week. That always tends to go to the World of Warships videos. The two World of Warships videos last week are currently sitting at 99.5 and 99.4%. Um, the bottom of the pack, of course, is always the Far Cry video, but even that's sitting at 98.7%. But getting a 99% approval rating for a War Thunder video is pretty spectacular around here. Although if you've seen the video, you probably understand why. <laughs> Certainly the funniest thing I've seen this year. And I've been playing Far Cry 6, so... <laughs> but I'm really glad everybody enjoyed that video as much as they did. It's certainly the dumbest thing I've seen this year. And that comes the day after <laughs> a World of Warships. Yes, yeah, Sakazuki, I know. I know you liked it as well. But yeah, the dumbest... That KV2 video from War Thunder is the dumbest thing I've seen this year. That's right, I'm getting to it, Akazuki. It comes the day after a World of Warships video where a guy finds out that his entire team are bots and still manages to win. <laughs> and that was pretty dumb, but it was only the dumbest thing that me and Akazuki had seen this year until I fired up that KV-2 War Thunder replay. <laughs> and suddenly there was a new sheriff in town. <laughs> so, honestly, if you haven't already seen that video, and, you know, more than 70,000 of you already have. But if you didn't watch it just because you don't like War Thunder, seriously, give it a try. Just just forget that it's War Thunder, because the game isn't what's important about that video. It's what happens in it. I don't want to give any spoilers, <laughs> but anybody who has seen it will agree. Trust me, it's worth it. Well, anyway, I haven't actually been playing anything new this week. Or, as you can see by the background footage, I've been haven't yet another go at Cyberpunk 2077. Honestly, I can't wait for them to get their fingers out and actually produce some DLC for this game. But I have been looking with great interest at a game that's coming out from an independent American developer by the name of Campfire Studios. It's called War of Rights, and it's the first actual game that they've done. They have previously worked on other people's titles, but this is their first solo project. And it's an American Civil War, I really want to say simulator, it's kind of a first-person squad-based shooter. And if you're thinking, how the hell do you do a first-person squad-based shooter in the US Civil War, that's an incredibly good question. I was browsing videos on YouTube and I stumbled across it, and uh, you think about it, the US Civil War was lots and lots of men standing in straight lines firing muskets at each other. Uh, pretty short ranges. How the hell do you do that? Or more specifically, how do you convince hundreds of players to do that? To stand in lines in open ground waiting to get shot? Because if you throw a bunch of people into a multiplayer game with guns, they're going to go Rambo. Because that's just what happens. So how do you encourage players to not do that and instead actually act like Union or Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. So that 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 got me intrigued. And I haven't actually got the game myself, but I have watched a lot of YouTube videos on it. And I'm 
getting very, very tempted uh, to get myself a copy. Because the way they've solved this fundamental problem, how do you get a bunch of players in a multiplayer game to not act like a bunch of players in a multiplayer game? I mean, you know, the people who are interested in the American Civil War, they're obviously going to try to do it properly. But that's only really going to work in the early stages, you know, when it's in crowdfunding, when it's in Kickstarter. Well, it's out of crowdfunding. You can actually get it on Steam, although it is still technically early access. Um, they've got artillery, they've got infantry. I think they're currently playtesting cavalry. But at the moment, it's just artillery and infantry. And the people playing it are not just the ones who are heavily into the subject matter, because it's now available on Steam. So, you know, Joe Public, random strangers, are going to maybe want to take a go. How do you get them to take it seriously and stand in formation with the rest of their regiment, rather than just running off and going Rambo? And the way they have done it is pretty ingenious. Because the trick, as always with these sort of things, is you have to make the player want to play it properly. You have to incentivize playing with the rest of your unit in formation, rather than just punishing not playing with the rest of the unit in formation. So when you are in formation with the rest of your regiment, you get all kinds of benefits. Your musket fire is more accurate, the effects of suppressive fire are less, and you don't cost your team as many points if you die while you're in formation with the rest of your unit. If you go Rambo and run off, if you are not in formation, then you suffer all kinds of penalties. They're not particularly bad. Um, you don't get the morale buff from having other teammates around, for example, so you tend to run out of stamina faster, your shots aren't quite as accurate. But if you get killed when you're out of formation, you cost your team a lot of points. So it makes you want to actually play as a confederate or union soldier properly by incentivizing it and rewarding it making you more effective when you are standing shoulder to shoulder in a line with the rest of your unit and when a regiment opens fire with massed musket volleys it looks absolutely incredible uh, the period of attention to detail in this game is really really good honestly i wish i'd already installed it and played it so i could show you some uh, video of it but i'm definitely going to get it and i'm definitely going to give it a go i mean it is still in alpha it is still in early access and there are bugs um but and obviously you know the, the whole period thing is probably not going to be everybody's cup of tea there's a reason why games like battlefield and call of duty are as popular as they are but, well, I've just been itching for something that little bit different, and this game is absolutely ticking all of the boxes at the moment, so you can probably expect there to be some gameplay footage of War of Rights popping up on the channel, um, hopefully soon, and if you're interested, and you can't wait for me, then absolutely get yourself onto YouTube and check out some of the available footage that's already there. In particular, there's a guy called General Cody who live streams it, and has many, many videos on the subject of this game and they're all worth watching so that's war of rights from campfire studios i'm definitely going to be checking that out well i thought we'd finish off this week's episode of mingles by answering a couple of questions from the salt mines discord server so i headed over there to check out the latest batch of questions and while i couldn't possibly answer them all i'll have a good stab at answering some so this first question comes from basement jesus i'm pretty sure we've heard from him before he said hello mr jingles simple question for you today where do you find the replays that you feature in mingles with jingles or during q a sessions are they from replay websites the replays channel here on the salt mines discord server or are they the ones sent to you that don't quite make the cut to make a video on well they're not from replay websites i don't just go surfing world of tanks replays.com or world of warships replays.com and pick something without getting permission uh, from the person who uploaded the replay so these are all replays that people have sent in. Basically, it's the third option. Replays that people have sent in to me that, for one reason or another, just didn't make the cut for a dedicated video of their own. For example, um, I think it was last week's episode of Mingles with Jingles, there was a match where somebody was in a Churchill gun carrier. And I used it as the background for Mingles with Jingles. Because despite the fact that you may not have realised this when you were watching it, it's actually the third highest scoring damage done by anybody, anywhere, in a Churchill gun carrier. But, and this is often the case with tank destroyer replays, 
you know, if you're doing it well, generally you're sitting in a bush somewhere without being spotted, just racking up large amounts of damage. And that's great, because often that's how you're supposed to play a tank destroyer. But it's not particularly interesting to watch. Nevertheless, it was the third highest score that anybody had ever achieved anywhere in a Churchill gun carrier. So I figured it deserved to be seen, even if there was no way I was going to be able to do a dedicated video on it because the nature of the gameplay was actually kind of dull. So that's usually what happens when something ends up appearing as background footage in an episode of Mings with Jingles. It's because it just didn't really, for one reason or another, make the cut for a video of its own. But at the same time there was enough going on and there was something unique about it that I just didn't really feel comfortable deleting it. And Mingles with Jingles is the perfect place. If you want to pay attention to what's going on in the background, you absolutely can. Um, but it's not the focus of Mingles with Jingles. My talking is the focus of Mingles with Jingles. So, you know, it works in that respect. Silverwings had a good one. He says, To the Mighty Jingles, I was listening to Dak earlier today. I presume he's talking about Drak uh recovering from the COVID virus. Oh, I didn't realise. He mentioned something called Condition Z. What is it and what does it mean? I think he's referring to Condition Zulu, which is a watertight integrity state. So there are three of them. This is a Navy thing, obviously. There's Condition X-Ray, Condition Yankee, and Condition Zulu. They're in ascending level of watertight integrity, with Condition X-Ray being the lowest, Condition Yankee being in the middle, and Condition Zulu being the highest level of watertight integrity, generally when the ship's just sailing, or when it's tied up alongside and there are no navigational hazards. The ship's in condition X-ray, which is the lowest watertight integrity condition. So basically, not all, but almost all of the ship's doors and hatches can be left open just to facilitate ease of um, movement around the ship. Struggle to think of the word there for a second. If there's anything even slightly dangerous going on that could be slightly dangerous, for example, your ammunitioning, um, and there's a risk of an explosion, in which case you prefer the ship not to flood instantly, or if you're uh, sailing from harbour or entering harbour or if you're refuelling at sea and you've got a bunch of lines and fuel hoses strung between you and the ship that you're refuelling from you know there's a significant danger of collision for example then you go to watertight condition Yankee one up from x-ray and in condition Yankee almost all of the doors and hatches have to be shut and because the Navy doesn't employ geniuses who can carry schematics around in their head of exactly which doors and hatches have to be shut or open in whichever watertight condition, the Navy makes it easy for everybody, and every door, hatch, everything on board the ship that can be opened or closed has a marking on it, a condition marking, whether X-Ray, Yankee, or Zulu. So you don't have to know which doors have to be shut in condition Yankee, because it'll have a big black Yankee, or letter Y, painted on it. Now, Condition Zulu, or what you referred to as Condition Z, is the highest state of watertight integrity. And basically, if you're in Condition Zulu, you're probably getting shot at. Right? Because when you go to action stations, first there'll be a blast on the main broadcast alarm, and then you'll hear somebody saying, hands to action stations, hands to action stations, assume NBCD State 1, Condition Zulu. The NBCD State which stands for Nuclear Biological Chemical Defense. And I'm pretty sure that they call it something else now. It might be CBRND, Chemical Biological Radiolo... It all means exactly the same thing. They just keep changing the precise terminology every 10 years or so. The state is is the ship's manpower. Right, during state three, it's cruising watches. State two, defense watches, where 50% of the ship's company are up and at work at any given time. The other half are sleeping, and then they swap around usually every eight hours. State one is everybody's ass is up and you're at your action station. And the condition, condition Zulu, that means that on your way to your action station, you shut every single door and hatch behind you. And if you have to move around the ship when it's at condition Zulu, and there are all kinds of reasons why you might have to, you know, the ship takes a hit, there's a fire needs fighting, you know, the firefighting teams have to get there, the first aid teams have to get there, you open the door, and you shut it behind you again. Not just to prevent the ship from flooding if it takes a hit in a compartment below the waterline, but those doors 
also form fire and smoke boundaries, so it's vitally important that they stay shut when the ship's in action. So yeah, thanks for that question. I always like getting questions that give me an excuse to waffle on about the Navy. So, <laughs> And you lot do seem to enjoy listening to me answer them too. But I'm afraid that is about all we have time for. So I hope you've all enjoyed this episode of Mingles with Jingles. I hope you all had a great weekend. And as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.